Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Tuesday Reitano and I'm the Deputy Director of the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. And I am super pleased to welcome you all here to a launch discussion for our newest report from the Observatory of the Listed Economies and the Ukraine Conflict, which is called An Altered State, Evolving Drug Trends in Wartime Ukraine. This report is born out of nearly two years, about um, 20 months worth of research across Ukraine and neighboring countries looking at how both drug flows and drug usage patterns have changed since the Russian full-scale invasion. We are trying to understand the dynamics of the illicit economy and how they engage with the broader political economy, what risks they're presenting to uh, the rule of law, to governance, to security, and of course, to development and the concerns for the Ukrainian people. We are, uh, this particular paper comes as a much wider effort um, within the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime to understand the changes to the underworld that have resulted from the conflict. We have a number of publications, which we'll summarize at the end, which relate to this topic in different ways. And we have a number of follow-on studies to come, because as you will see, this study itself has thrown open a lot of very interesting questions. I will shortly turn the floor over to our two presenters, both of whom are GI staff members working um, in the Ukraine Observatory. But before I do, I would like to just give you a little bit of an overview in terms of housekeeping. This meeting will be about 90 minutes long. We have closed the chat, but the Q&A is open. So if you are online and joining us, you are most welcome to put any questions at any time into the Q&A screen or to raise your hand. Um, we will have two presentations, the joint presentation between Fadir Suduruk, who is our representative in Ukraine, and Ruggiero Skaturo, who's a senior analyst who splits his time between the Observatory for Ukraine and the um, Observatory for Southeastern Europe. And we are also incredibly pleased to have with us Gana Dovka, sorry, apologies for the terrible pronunciation, um, who is the executive director of the Eurasian Harm Reduction Association, which is a nonprofit organization coordinating harm reduction activities, policies and organizations across Central and Eastern Europe and Central Asia. So we will very much look forward to hearing the perspective of all of our participants. And after the presentations, we will open up for questions. This meeting is being broadcast live on YouTube Live, so uh, for everybody's information, and it will also be recorded and placed on the GI website afterwards so you can access it uh, as well. My colleagues will put a link to the full report that we are presenting into the chat, and it is on our website right on the homepage banner if you want to find it. Um, we look forward to engaging with everybody today. I hope you find the presentation interesting and useful. We very much look forward to your feedback. So with no further ado, I'm extremely pleased to open the, uh, pass the floor to Ruggiero and Fidir, um, who will present, and they will begin exactly sharing screens right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tuesday. One second, so that I can set this up also in presentation mode. Yes, can you all see my screen? Okay, cool. So uh, thank you very much again, Tuesday, and to, to all. Uh, this is uh, a great occasion for us as for the, for the first time today, uh, we really uh, delve into a crucial aspect of the ongoing war in Ukraine, which is the evolving dynamics of its uh, illicit drug markets. Over the uh, past few months, uh, many have uh, briefly touched upon it, particularly uh, the media, either focusing on uh, a particular drug or by giving an overview of the potential uh, trends. While with uh, an altered state, uh, instead we really try to go uh, as deep as possible uh, uh, with the goal of providing insights uh, solid enough uh, for policy making. And in this uh, presentation, we will uh, briefly uh, touch upon pre-war uh, trends, just to give an idea of what has changed. We mentioned uh, the alteration, so it's also key uh, to give an idea of what the situation or from what basically the situation has, has changed. And to do so, uh, um, we will uh, touch upon some of the, of the uh, trends that we have spotted. And uh, of course, this presentation is far from comprehensive. We will need uh, way more time to go uh, deep into, into each and every uh, drug that we have um, analyzed. 
so after and then so after spotting the trends, we will then discuss a little bit the challenges of the, for example, the newly introduced uh, law on uh, on medical cannabis use, and we will then finish off with some uh, some recommendations. <clears throat> so. Before uh, Russian uh, invasion in February 2022, Ukraine was already a significant player in the global uh, drug uh, trade, serving as both a transit point for drugs testing for, for Western Europe, but also a consumer uh, destination in its, own, uh, in its own right. You can see uh, listed here some key uh, facts, uh, which give us an understanding of the pre-invasion uh, market characteristics. Firstly, cannabis. Uh, widely cultivated outdoor in, in Ukraine has always been a significant uh, player in the country's drug uh, market. And with prices, as you can see here, that the retail level uh, ranging between two and, and four euro per gram, uh, cannabis use has always been rather uh, common in, in Ukraine. Next, we have Odessa, uh, the sport uh, city uh, used uh, to serve as a major uh, transit hub for cocaine trafficking into Ukraine, direction not only, uh, of course, the capital Kiev, which is and uh, which was and still is the major uh, consumer market as far as uh, cocaine is concerned, but also Russia and also Southeastern Europe, particularly the Western Balkans. Uh, the flow of cocaine through Odessa really uh, underscored the city's importance uh, in the regional drug trade since the late. 2000s and uh, certainly throughout the 2010s, uh, really highlighting also the challenges the challenges that uh, uh, law enforcement uh, agency uh, have to face in combating uh, particularly cocaine trafficking. And for that, of course, we also have published recently um, a report which is titled "Port in a Storm," which is basically the political economy of of, of Odessa and, and its region. But I will come back to we will come back to to cocaine um, in a in a little bit. Moving uh, on to heroin, so despite the efforts uh, to, co to curb uh, its spread, Ukraine had, uh, before the invasion, a well-established uh, heroin market with an estimated 350,000 adults, or 1.7% of the adult uh, population, injecting opioids and very likely uh, mainly uh, uh, heroin. Uh, and again, also for Heron, I will I will uh, I will come back uh, I will come back to to, this, to the analysis of this uh, of this substance in a little bit. And then lastly, uh, synthetic drugs. Ukraine has seen uh, a record number of seizures and lab uh, busts in recent years. With uh, just to give you a number, uh, the number of laboratory busts increased from five in 2019 to 67 in in 2020. So this already before the invasion really pointed to um, a well established supply meeting. Uh, the local demand for synthetic drugs, highlighting already in the recent past the growing uh, prevalence of these substances in, uh, in the country. <clears throat> the conflict, uh, however, has brought about uh, profound uh, changes in this landscape and disruption to traditional supply routes, such as the closure of the port of Odessa due to the Russian naval blockade, has, for example, forced cocaine traffickers to adapt uh, uh, quickly to the new context. The result uh, was definitely a shifting uh, market characterized by the emergence of synthetic drugs, particularly MPS salts, and uh, also new uh, trafficking patterns. But it's, of course, not only uh, logistics uh, that are changing, that have changed and are still changing. And this presentation can be roughly divided into uh, three major thematic focuses or areas. You can see them listed here. One uh, is the immediate impact of the Russian invasion then the shifts in the drug market, and then the effects of the war on drug use. So through specific cases and focuses on a particular substance, we will try to show how not only supply uh, adapted to the, to the new context brought about by the, by the invasion, but also how the, the lacquer has inflicted uh, immeasurable uh, suffering on the Ukrainian people, leaving civilians in constant fear and soldiers also engaged in intense conflict. In fact, in the face of, of such uh, hardship, uh, many uh, have turned to drugs, not least for a, a temporary uh, escape. So from cannabis to synthetic, uh, so synthetic drugs and synthetic opioids, uh, the, the range of substances being used is rather diverse, posing, of course, significant uh, health risks to individuals uh, and also uh, to the country as a whole. Now, 
Regarding the first point of our presentation, um, the impact, which is the impact of the war on, on drug routes, uh, we can delve now into uh, cocaine trafficking, which is probably the most uh, illustrative example of how trafficking patterns may interact, but then relatively quickly adapt to the new, uh, to the new context. Until uh, February 2022, so the Russian uh, full-scale invasion, cocaine used to enter Ukraine via the support, as you can see uh, from the red uh, dotted uh, vectors in the map on the, on the left. And the market was relatively stable, also with retail prices pretty much uh, resembling those of Western European markets, so around 120, 130 euro uh, per gram, of course, depending on, on the purity. However, since uh, February 2022, and for at least uh, one year uh, of observation, uh, we have, we have observed actually a strong decrease in uh, in availability. So cocaine was no longer uh, supplied to uh, to Ukraine, likely uh, due to the naval blockade. Given, of course, that uh, cocaine enters uh, Western Europe in containerized um, cargo, and this is this definitely had an impact also on the retail uh, prices of the little quantity that in a way was still uh, available in the country. And you can see uh, here from the bar chart on, uh, on the right, the price per gram went up after the Russian invasion uh, to even actually 180 euro per gram. The, the red uh, chart, the red bars here are actually just um, an average, but the, we also collected that uh, uh, at the retail level and some were 180, 190 euro per gram. Then after one year, and precisely around March, uh, uh, April 2023, from interviews with law enforcement authorities, we started hearing quite often that cocaine made it uh, basically back to the to the market in Ukraine. Um, and then it was also arriving in insignificant uh, quantities. So to validate this, uh, this hypothesis, we not only started mapping seizures, but also collected that on prices at the retail level again. Um, so regarding seizures, we uh, noted that most of the seizures of 100 and plus uh, kilograms uh, were uh, and are now uh, still concentrated around the western borders of Ukraine. Uh, particularly close uh, to Romania, as you can see um, from the blue vectors here on the map. While the seizures of more small quantities, so up to 5, uh, 10, 10 grams, were instead concentrated in Kiev and, uh, and Odessa, pointing at a system of uh, wholesale trade in the, in the West of quantities which, which then get progressively cut and recut until they, uh, they reach their final uh, destination market. Um, to confirm the trend, we have also observed that prices at the retail level also started to decrease, particularly around uh, April, May uh, 2023, going down almost to uh, pre-war time. So as of August 2023, the price for, for one gram of cocaine ranged between 130 and 140 uh, euro. Uh, again, depending on, uh, on, uh, on, the, on the purity of the substance. Fred, feel free to, of course, in, in, interrupt me in case you wish uh, to add anything at this stage. I can't see you, but I, but please just uh, just stop me whenever whenever you you, you see an opportunity to add uh, something. Um, I can I can add uh, yes. add to to please, what we please. did. We we did a lot of field work uh, to get this report done, and we went to different uh, regions in Ukraine to see how the war has changed everything that's going on. And uh, the main trend is that um, the, the uh, entry points into Ukraine have changed and the exit points uh, from Ukraine have changed. Of we, Ruggiero was talking about cocaine. So uh, another factor which uh, you need to, um, to know is that uh, the main market for cocaine, of course, in Ukraine is uh, so-called wealthy people. The, the average salary in Ukraine is pretty low. So cocaine is considered the rich man's uh, drug. So when uh, at the start of the invasion, millions of people uh, left Ukraine, uh, the drug market, the cocaine drug market also left Ukraine with them and shifted to mostly Western Europe, to Eastern Europe, to Turkey, other countries. So the people who uh, actually use cocaine, they left. And now we're seeing a situation when a lot of the people have come back and the market has come back with them. And so has demand. And to meet this demand, 
cocaine was uh, when we asked, you know, the police um, at the start, how was it at the start of the invasion? I mean, how was the drug market? And they said, we were so happy. You know, it's like you could you could just leave your car unopened, unlocked, and, you know, nobody would steal it. So was the drug situation. There was just no drugs on the street. They were all gone. And now we asked them, how how is it going? And they said, everything is back. So cocaine was the, one of the great absentees at the start of the invasion, but now it's back with force. Thank you. We can now move on actually to the next uh, substance uh, analyzed in the context of the immediate impact of the war. Heroin is uh, definitely an, a particularly illustrative uh, example, uh, but for different reasons. We titled uh, this slide and also the chapter uh, in, the in, the, in the report, The Great uh, Absentee, because as said before, heroin was uh, largely uh, present in Ukraine until uh, the, re the recent past, until 2020, 2021. But despite initial, initial concerns that uh, heroin use would rise significantly, there is no uh, evidence that we were uh, that we were able to, to to collect pointing at any availability of the substance in Ukraine. On the contrary, actually, uh, likely uh, due to intensification of hostilities right where heroin used to pass and enter Ukraine in the east, international traffickers uh, may have rerouted the flows to alternative pathways, particularly, for example, via the Western Balkans, uh, which is a finding that is also substantiated by. Uh, other studies that we have conducted uh, in the Observatory of Illicit Economies in Southeastern Europe on the impact of, of the war on drug markets. So basically, uh, throughout our period uh, of observation, we noticed uh, shortages in, uh, in supply, shortages which have also been confirmed uh, by uh, rising prices at the retail level that we have been able to, to collect. Uh, we were observing a price uh, per one gram of heroin of up to 90 uh, euro. And because of a uh, lack in uh, in supply, we have observed also uh, a noticeable uh, shift in drug preferences among opioid uh, users in, uh, in Ukraine. Starting in 2020, as I said before, there's been a clear uh, or progressive uh, transition uh, definitely from uh, heroin to methadone, legally obtained and then resold in the black markets, uh, and also the so-called uh, street methadone created in, uh, in clandestine laboratories. And this shift is likely also driven by supply constraints, uh, as I said before, and also rising heroin prices, basically forcing users to seek uh, alternative uh, substances. In addition to methadone, uh, we are also seeing the emergence of alternative uh, substitutes in the black market, such as buprenorphine, and this, uh, in a way, underscores the diversification of, of, of opioid uh, substitutes available to users in Ukraine, highlighting the need uh, for comprehensive uh, strategies to address this evolving challenge. But I'm sure that you will, that you will uh, hear uh, more about that from our uh, next uh, speakers as well. Moving on to the uh, second uh, thematic focus of this presentation, so the shifts in, uh, in drug markets, the rise of uh, new uh, psychoactive substances used in Ukraine is probably the most uh, relevant trend identified in the context of this study. And of course, it also poses a number of challenges, not only for the security providers, but also from a health uh, related uh, perspective. Over the last uh, two years, uh, there's been a significant surge in seizures of synthetic catenons and particularly alpha PVP and methadrone, commonly known as salts. And these substances are not only increasingly available to civilians and particularly uh, minors, uh, but also uh, being found in alarming quantities in uh, in the front line. And here, actually, uh, Fred, it would be uh, great if you could also um, uh, give us an understanding of not only the epidemics, uh, as referred to by especially by the media, um, about suicidal um, instincts, uh, but then also the the some some insights from 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 your recently published blog on uh, on salts in the front line. Okay, so uh, salts uh, you you know have been a purge in Ukraine for quite some time, but the invasion has added to the problem. We are seeing several trends. First of all, uh, the laboratories that were uh, mostly in the east of Ukraine are shifting to the to central Ukraine and western Ukraine, which is an important factor for distribution of the drug. 
Second of all, we're seeing a lot of clandestine laboratories. So basically makeshift laboratories everywhere, which makes it hard to, uh, to kind of clamp down on these laboratories. Uh, what we're also seeing is a dangerous trend with a lot of uh, drugs and uh, salts in particular being used on the front line. We uh, have uh, published in the report and we mentioned it in the report and inferred a lot about uh, specific uh, criminal groups targeting soldiers on the front line, plus a lot of the local population uh, targeting soldiers at the front line. Uh, there was a, a large group uh, in Krivy which is in the Dnipro Petrovsk region near the city of Dnipro. It's the second largest city. It's uh, it's a region close to the Don Donetsk region, so it makes it close to the front line. And there was a large gang called the Twenties. We uh, received a lot of information, and the police have managed to dismantle this uh, this gang. But this gang specifically targeted all of its products to the front line. So that means that all of the labs they had in the region produced products and uh, managed to find ways of transporting product, their product to the front line. Also, what we're seeing is that um, there is a problem with drugs on the front line because during our research, we managed to find out that a lot of the um, patients in rehab clinics, for instance, at the start of the war were mobilized or drafted to to the army without being checked for their health because there was this you know emergency situation extraordinary situation where uh, ukraine needed soldiers to defend uh, the territory its territory and so a lot of those people went to the front line and in some cases they became sort of the link from uh, you know criminal groups producing the product to people who were looking for the product on the front line so we see that as a dangerous trend we have heard that, of course, it is being addressed. We have also heard that uh, a lot of the stuff that happens on the front line depends on the kind of commander you have, the kind of unit where you serve. So we've heard some troubling things about certain units, but we did hear good things about other units. So it's not massive, it's not organized, but it is a trend. We will also talk about a an important drug group called Himprom, which also targets uh, soldiers at the front line. Another um, troubling trend is, of course, the way that salts, which are very cheap um, and are easy to buy, easy to sell, easy to produce, uh, are one of the reasons for the epidemic of suicides we have in Ukraine. For instance, there have been at least a dozen suicides in the last two months of young people in, in Kiev. The latest suicide was in the city of Lviv, which is you know far away from the front line. But uh, unofficially, this, this has all been linked to salts. And because salts, they cause a lot of psychological problems. They do a lot of psychological damage, not just physical damage. You don't get addicted, just addicted to it, but you also suffer psychological problems. And uh, when talking to narcologists in Ukraine, we have heard stories of young people as young as 14, you know, 15 years old, coming into clinics uh, with psychoses, uh, which is, you know, a troubling sign because they're so young and you'd need to do a lot of stuff to get psychoses. So uh, salts are the, probably they, they have uh, become the drug number one here in Ukraine after, of course, weed, because cannabis still remains the drug of choice for everyone. And while talking to the soldiers uh, on the front line or soldiers who have come back from the front line, we have heard things like, well, we don't consider we a drug, you know, we kind of use it from time to time, which is not to say that this is a uniquely Ukrainian thing, because we've had reports from the other side saying that, you know, the Russian soldiers uh, and the separatist soldiers are using it extensively. But we are seeing that because soldiers are a, um, a part of the population that receives a lot of money, they're, you know, they receive more than the average Ukrainian. They have the money, and that's why they're targeted because they can, you know, sell. Uh, they can buy more drugs. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a, a couple of points uh, regarding, uh, still on the on the security aspect. Um, so, police and an operation, police operations and field work uh, have revealed uh, concerning. Uh, level of sophistication in the trafficking of precursors uh, using the production of, of the synthetic continents and trafficking routes from China, Poland, Turkey, and particularly uh, also Egypt, which has emerged recently also, 
have been uh, identified multiple times, highlighting also the the, the, the global uh, nature of of this uh, of this illicit trade. In addition, um, it is also essential to uh, recognize the role of experienced uh, cooks, as these are the really the, the key actors in the manufacturing process uh, of this uh, of the salts. And these individuals really uh, possess the expertise uh, to produce high quality uh, salts, which are perceived also favorably by, 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 by users. And this also stands in, in contrast to the declining uh, perceived quality of other synthetic drugs and particularly amphetamine type uh, stimulants, further in a way driving the demand uh, for, for salts. Uh, so why basically the question is why buying amphetamines for the same price if I if the quality is perceived uh, to be lower than than than, than salts, and then lastly, the comparatively uh, low prices and large availability of synthetic cathinones are drop of points, uh, which are easily arranged also through uh, Telegram uh, channels, have contributed also to their widespread uh, use. So the ease of access and the affordability uh, together really pose significant challenges uh, for law enforcement first, but also for the public health efforts to combat uh, the proliferation of, of such, of such uh, substances. This slide uh, is just to give you an, an understanding, an idea of uh, the, 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 the type of analysis that we have conducted with, with prices. Um, in the graph, you can see uh, um, the cost of alpha PVP in the Odessa region, data which has been collected between June and July 2023. Uh, in blue, the blue crystal, and in red, the, the white crystals. So uh, as you can see, the price per unit, so per gram uh, purchased, uh, decreases when multiple of grams are, are purchased. And this, of course, suggests high level of availability, but it, of availability, but it's also, uh, it also constitutes an incentive, not only for traffickers, who of course benefit from the wholesale uh, prices uh, compared to the retail prices, and then are incentivized to stock uh, the substances. But it's also an incentive for users who see this as an opportunity to buy more for less, uh, of course, than uh, with the ultimate consequence of fueling uh, dependency due to um, high availability. Coming next, uh, so behind, the large availability of synthetic drugs and particularly uh, um, salts, so especially uh, alpha PVP, uh, there is Kimprom, uh, which is a Russian Ukrainian outfit, let's call it outfit, that plays an increasingly uh, significant role in trafficking uh, synthetic drugs and precursors in Ukraine, but also in, in neighboring countries. And I would like now to, to give the floor again back to, to Fred uh, for. Uh, a little bit of a um, description of how it operates, where it operates, and um, also why it is uh, successful in Ukraine and in the wider region. Uh, yes, yeah, so we, when we talk about large groups, uh, drug groups that exist in Ukraine, uh, we need to mention Kimprom, uh, which we call a conglomerate uh, because it operates. It's a transnational group. It started in Russia but then sort of moved most of its operations to Ukraine. Uh, the alleged uh, leader of, uh, of Kimprom actually lives in Mexico and uh, sort of controls uh, the, uh, the organization from there. But he has a lot of people here in Ukraine. The, um, the international part of it is that a lot of the product is produced in, for instance, and in, we have this in the report, partially in Georgia, in the Central Asian republics, uh, specifically in Kazakhstan and in Tajikistan. So, uh, but most of some of the stuff is actually sold to Russia. So they have laboratories around Russia. They ran into trouble with uh, the Russian authorities and they've moved their production uh, elsewhere. Um, Kimprom is sort of unique. Uh, some say it, it represents the future of drug, drug trafficking because of the way it works. Uh, the way it operates is it operates as a franchise basically. So it gives you an opportunity to produce and to sell uh, it doesn't use any physical contact for you to 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 uh, produce and to sell your drug and to buy your drugs. What it does, it it sort of you you get in touch with them and they give you all the materials, their precursors. You produce the product and they, then you sell it through their uh, their marketplaces. 
Uh, you may have heard uh, that was, there was a big story several years ago about the Germans clamping down on a marketplace called Hydra, which was, uh, I think, the biggest marketplace, the drug marketplace in, in the world. And uh, Kimprom was already part of that. Um, but right now, since Hydra is gone, but there are others, uh, specifically Rutor and uh, Kraken, uh, so two of the marketplaces that, uh, that Kimprom uses. One of the uh, sort of interesting things uh, about Himprom is that uh, it actually cares uh, about its uh, reputation. It actually cares about the quality uh, because uh, we have heard a lot of stories and we have proof of that, that they're actually using call centers. So if you are dissatisfied with the quality of your product, you can actually call a call center and say, you know, I'm this, this will not do. You know, I need I need better drugs. This quality won't isn't satisfactory. And they actually, you know, react. Uh, so so it's uh, it's a kind of an interesting operation. And uh, the the troubling thing is that the the latest news is that uh, they're actually expanding and they're expanding to. Eastern Europe. Uh, we have heard information about them expanding to Slovakia and the Czech Republic in particular, uh, but uh, it won't stop there because of the way it works. It works as a franchise, so you, it doesn't have to be physically uh, in any of the countries, but you can sort of use all the services it provides. So it's, um, it, you know, it's a virtual operator, so to speak. So I think that this is something that uh, needs to be in the focus of law enforcement. And we did talk to law enforcement representatives about it. And they say that, yeah, you know, when we clamped down on the 20s who were physically producing in Krivirik and, uh, you know, uh, transporting their product to uh, the front line and other places, that was easy. But how do you destroy uh, a uh, conglomerate that, you know, exists only, exists only virtually? I know that the leaders of Kimprom have had problems here in Ukraine, but on the other hand, we have seen that they uh, also did a unique thing. They did a PR campaign here in Ukraine. There was a PR campaign with billboards, with uh, videos using Ukrainian celebrities. And the PR campaign was uh, was um, named uh, Catch the Dealer. So uh, the PR campaign was about, about them uh, proposing to pay you money for supposedly catching dealers, for catching the guys who did the dead drops, the drop-offs. And a lot more money, like a million hryvnia, which is like maybe 25,000 uh, euros for uh, giving the police information about laboratories. So if you if you gave the police information about labs, you would receive, you know, 25,000 euros. The problem is that it seems that most of the laboratories that were found and the dead drop guys and the, uh, the dealers were uh, competitors. So, uh, and the police sort of clamped down on them, which, you know, makes it kind of funny and interesting. We have also uh, received information that Himprom has uh, physically dealt with some competitors in different regions where uh, they um, sort of appeared where they haven't appeared before. Like in Western Ukraine, which was never a uh, Himprom territory, mostly Central and Eastern Ukraine, uh, a, we know of a so-called thief in law or uh, authoritet, which is like the a le a criminal leader being shot in, in a, um, he was actually in a gym, working out in a gym and he was shot through the window and um, he didn't die, but he's a vegetable now, basically. Uh, and he controlled the drug market in the specific Western Ukrainian region. And now he's gone and we are receiving information that Kimprom is actively in the region. So this is uh, a large organization, an organization that is uh, ruthless, an organization that is very creative, and an organization that is spreading and thinking about the future. Thanks. Thank you. We can now uh, enter the third and final uh, chapter of our presentation, so which is the effect of war of the war on on drug use. So as said before, the, uh, the, the, the war has inflicted immeasurable uh, suffering of, on the Ukrainian people, uh, leaving civilians in constant fear and also soldiers um, in the front line. And in this context, we also argue that cannabis uh, is widely used in Ukraine and it's a significant player in the country's uh, drug market. In the report, we also highlight uh, 
particularly uh, since the beginning of the of the Russian invasion, also an increase uh, in the demand of indoor uh, cultivated cannabis, uh, and especially of strains with very high levels of, uh, of THC. At the same time, though, for, for years, uh, the Ukrainian society has been pushing for the legalization of medical cannabis use. And in a way, the Russian invasion has played uh, a key uh, pushing factor for the momentum uh, that cannabis organization is experiencing in, uh, in the country. A number of studies and surveys have also been launched in the recent past to support the efficacy of cannabis organization to treat PTSD. And as a result, the Ukrainian parliament uh, has uh, moved towards legalizing medical cannabis use with a draft law uh, approved in December 2023, and a law that has also been signed uh, by, by President Zelensky a uh, couple of weeks ago, and the law is going to enter into force in, uh, in around six months. This legislation marks uh, a significant shift in the country's approach to cannabis, uh, aiming uh, to distinguish between medical uh, cannabis and industrial hemp, while also uh, raising uh, the permissible THC uh, levels, so the potency limit for medical cannabis cultivation. Under uh, this law, uh, medical uh, cannabis can only be uh, cultivated using uh, officially approved uh, seeds under strict state oversight with a THC potency limit, which has been increased uh, from 0.08% to 0.3%. In addition, then uh, the, the bill also proposes restriction on the import of uh, legal cannabis into Ukraine, except for specific purposes such as uh, horticulture and scientific research, at least until uh, uh, 2028. While uh, similar regulations uh, have been adopted in neighboring countries, but also in the wider region, uh, Czech Republic, Poland, uh, Croatia, a Ukraine's approach, uh, it's rather interesting because it really focuses on protecting uh, local producers by limiting imports. However, the transition to domestic uh, cannabis cultivation may uh, take several uh, several years, uh, presenting import-export opportunities for both local and international uh, businesses that are going to operate in this, uh, in this, in, in this uh, temporary phase at the interim. Uh, despite uh, the legalization of cannabis for medical use, uh, of course, challenges uh, remain, particularly regarding uh, the market regulation and also the meeting, uh, meeting the demand uh, for, the, for the potent strains that I was uh, mentioning before. The legislation THC potency limit, in fact, might uh, not suffice for the majority of the users of, of, of cannabis in the country, which is, of course, for recreational purposes. And this is, in fact, evidenced by uh, a rather widespread demand for very high uh, THC strains uh, cultivated uh, indoor or uh, imported from, uh, from the West. And this raises concern about, of course, reliance on illegal supply uh, channels and also the effectiveness as such of the legalization efforts. Uh, experiences from countries uh, from the West or, from, or even overseas, such as uh, Canada uh, really alights the risk associated with transitioning from illegal uh, to legal cannabis markets. Uh, illicit drug dealers continue to control a significant portion of many uh, of the countries that have uh, legalized um, cannabis markets, emphasizing also that the need uh, for uh, careful policy implementation and, uh, of course, ongoing attention to market uh, dynamics uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. And although this report is not a report on the on the on the policy debate around medical cannabis uh, in, in Ukraine, we really believe that uh, there is great room for further analysis in the in the near future. As of today, what we can say is that while this new law may alter the equilibrium of the drug market, particularly uh, in addressing PTSD and other uh, medical conditions, um, there is a strong need for careful uh, regulation and also for monitoring uh, the progress of the consumption markets to ensure effectiveness and also mitigate uh, the potential risks. I'm going to go now to the final slide of our presentation. As you can see here, um, we have just included a few of the many recommendations that we have formulated as a result of the, of the research conducted. 
I will go over those uh, concerning health first, and then I will touch upon security uh, related issues. So first, as just discussed, it is imperative that we closely uh, monitor the dynamics of PTSD uh, treatment, particularly regarding the effectiveness uh, of medical cannabis, but also uh, alternative uh, therapies. And as we navigate the complexities of addressing PTSD, uh, it is essential to also evaluate uh, the impact of uh, different treatment uh, modalities on, and also on, on patient uh, outcomes. And by systematically uh, tracking the effectiveness of medical cannabis and alternative therapies, we can really identify best practices, optimize uh, treatment approaches, and ultimately improve uh, the quality of care for individuals suffering from uh, from PTSD, a number of individuals which are going to likely uh, increase. And secondly, uh, we must really prioritize uh, research into both the short and uh, long-term effects of uh, salts uh, use. Synthetic catenons uh, have emerged as a significant concern due to their widespread availability and potential uh, health risks, something that uh, Fred was also uh, describing uh, before. And to better understand the implication of salts use, we really must conduct rigorous research to assess the immediate effect, but also the long-term consequences and also the potential harms. Regarding the security aspects, so first it is imperative that we prioritize the monitoring of the evolution of trafficking routes and also the actors that are involved in, uh, in the traffic. In particular, one, one typical example that was uh, explored in this presentation was the case of cocaine, but this pretty much applies also to other, to other uh, substances. And by closely monitoring these routes and the individuals or groups engaged in the trafficking, we can really adapt or suggest, of course, to adapt enforcement, law enforcement efforts and interdiction strategies to disrupt emerging uh, uh, illicit networks. Secondly, in response to the not noticeable uh, transition from heroin to street methadone and general synthetic, uh, other synthetic opioids, we, it is, there is a need to, to develop a systematic approach to address the, the opioid crisis, uh, particularly, as said before, concerning uh, street methadone. And lastly, uh, given the transnational nature uh, of organized crime with trafficking um, activities perpetrated by, by him from, it is crucial to partner with, with counterparts uh, across borders to tackle their illicit operations effectively. As said, uh, Kim's from activities span multiple countries, including Russia, uh, Belarus, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Georgia, making it essential, despite, of course, the, the, the circumstances to collaborate uh, closely with international partners to disrupt the criminal networks and dismantle their operation uh, as effectively uh, as possible. This was the uh, the last slide of our presentation. I will now give the floor back to uh, to Tuesday for an overview of uh, the the products uh, that we recently published, and in a way also connect with this uh, with this study. Thank you very much. Thank you to you, Ruggiero, and to Fadia for excellent presentations and a lot of very interesting insights and analysis. Um, there is more detail in the report. As um, Ruggiero has said, and that um, some of our evolving body of evidence will also be coming out in subsequent reports that are planned for the first quarter and mid-year mid of this year. We have put on the screen, as you can see, a list of the reports that have been published to which this presentation drew upon. So it's not only an altered state, but also a time of troubles, which is a report on Russian organized crime, the Crossroads paper, which looks at drug markets through Kazakhstan and uh, Central Asia, and Port in a Storm, which is the report on Odessa. Forthcoming, we have another uh, paper much more detailed, looking similarly at drug markets in Russia, as well as uh, further analysis on how narcotics markets um, interact with the problem of demobilization and reintegration of combatants, noting that they have been targeted by certain trafficking groups um, with illicit drugs on the front line. I'm now going to very happily pass the floor to Ghana, um, who is coming from the Eurasia Network. We, I see that there are questions. We'll hold them till the end, as I said, and I encourage you, if you wish to, to put more questions into the chat, and then we will have a round from all of our panelists. Ghana, the floor is yours. Yeah, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, I hope that you could hear me and could see my slides. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm I'm from Eurasian Harm Reduction Association, and I'm I'm happy that uh, such comprehensive research on on the drug markets is going on, and we really need this information. And I will share the the other part of the story uh, with the harm reduction services. Uh, and report is recommending to transform the harm reduction services to have more uh, services dedicated to uh, uh, NPS and 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 stimulants user uh, users and to to train medical professional including mental health professionals to, uh, to deal with the psychosis caused by 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 these dr new drugs and other drugs and from our side as a harm reductionist who are providing services we could say the same and that's important to hear all these two parts. And uh, we are working in 2019, uniting uh, activists and, uh, and organizations who are providing harm reduction services from 28 countries. And you could see the picture that Ukraine with a harm reduction is rather uh, good and the coverage by the service is very high. And that's uh, not um, due to challenges in the drug market or um, a uh, more uh, comprehensive approach, but mainly caused for the years of HIV epidemic about, among people who inject drugs. Uh, and now, uh, actually, the package of services of needle and syringe programs is very limited, and that's one of the challenge. But the good result is the services are there in comparison with the neighboring Romania or Bulgaria or um, Bosnia and Herzegovina and mainly Russia, who, who see uh, politically uh, harm reduction and opioid agonist treatment as a political threat for the country. Uh, so even despite the fact that a lot of hospitals were ruined and, and uh, yes, occupation came uh, in the occupied territories, uh, opioid substitution treatment and harm reduction is not available, even if the city is is safe. And that's one of the challenges and this disruption of the of the opioid agonist treatment for opioid users is really a life threatening events. And, and uh, we don't know how many people experienced it but we know several cases uh, since 2014 when when there were suicides and they were they were also um the uh court cases against people who are carrying opioid substitution treatment with them on occupied territories uh so but in the non-occupied ukraine in the free ukraine harm reduction works even with the, with the uh, situation of need in evacuation and need in in the uh, changing the place of living for people and activists from the people who use drugs they are really uh connecting people to the health services and giving them information and what what is important um part of the story that the coverage by the services is even higher than it was before full-scale invasion uh it's in accordance to center for public health data uh uh, they they are publishing it's uh, 170 uh, thousands people uh, covered by the harm reduction services. Again, unfortunately, the basic harm reduction services in all region, uh, but in Ukraine particularly, is rather limited to needles, uh, condoms, some information, and overdose prevention, naloxone. Uh, and it's available, which is very, very good sign um, for all these people. But uh, starting with the full-scale invasion, harm reduction sites and organizations became shelters for people who use drugs and their family members. And that's um, make them uh, do much more than they they have resources for. Uh, so so all around the globe, we were trying to to find resources to feed uh, our organizations with the uh, different new skills, uh, dealing with PTSD, dealing with mental health uh, challenges, dealing with the evacuation, having resources to accommodation for families, food and transportation. And I need to say that despite the fact that the news from Ukraine are not in the in the front pages of of the uh, 
of your your telephone all over the globe, evacuation is still happening. And, and these needs are not finished because people need to leave somewhere. And because of the stigma and high criminalized drug use and possession in Ukraine and high, high level of stigma against people from key populations, not only people who use drugs, but also people living with HIV or LGBT, these people are hardly, um, they, they, they could, could have bigger challenges to find temporary shelter or a place of living uh, in comparison with, with general population. So uh, coming to uh, opioid antagonist treatment, uh, that's a very important part. Ukraine is developing new pilots and developing this program. And actually, we are proud to say that, that in Ukraine, opioid antagonist treatment available in freedom and in prison actually the same as uh, harm reduction uh, needle syringe uh, exchange program and uh, was the ag uh, opioid agonist treatment uh, Center for Public Health doing all is possible uh, to make the barrier to the treatment lower. If you are living in the neighboring countries, let's say Hungary or Romania or Germany or Poland, the barrier, uh, the, the, you need to to, to to go through a lot of barriers to get opioid agonist treatment. In Ukraine, that's easier. And uh, since uh, this year, since 2023, the, um, the center, the, the Center for Public Health actually finally start controlling the private clinics. And that could change this uh, using the, the method on the legal markets because the private clinics, which, each, which we see from the community-led monitoring, uh, shows us uh, the very gray area because it's not a uh, proper opioid agonist treatment, but it's selling the recipes and sell selling the drugs um, in, in semi-legal areas. But since 2023, uh, Center for Public Health really incorporating these services into the, the national system of opioid agonist treatment. And it's already more um, almost 30,000 people receiving these services which is, which is crucial and important for for people to be to have also access to the other other medical services uh, I would agree with the with the issues on on mental health, uh, but I need to remind uh, from the public health perspective. I need to remind all of you um, and all of us that Eastern Europe and Central Asia have very uh, bad history with the psychiatry and psychi uh, mental health system. It's not uh, usually not mental health, but psychiatry treatment, which is very heavy. Uh, institutionalized and not open to work with the addiction and not open to work with the new challenges. Ukraine uh, nowadays um, make the pr highest priority to mental health care availability, accessibility for all people in Ukraine, understanding how traumatized we all are and all people are, but with the addiction treatment and with the uh, drug use um, Actually, not only Ukraine, but also Czechia, Poland, and other countries, neighboring countries, don't have this uh, methods how to stop this footballing by the by the by the people. Because if a psychiatrist will send you to addiction doctor, and addiction doctor will not do the psychiatry um, uh, screening and will not do the treatment. Uh, so, so this is for us as a harm reduction association regionally one of the key priority in advocacy to connect to interlink these two system. It's not easy and it's not just a training for professionals, but with the new drugs with salts, uh, that's one of the key priority. And we see this problem for several years in all region. And we already did the regional report in eight countries actually, and and highlighting with the with the health professionals the same issue which you highlighted. Uh, necessity for mental health. With the transforming uh, harm reduction for the stimulants user and NPS user, uh, that's one of the challenge because the drug checking services, which is already piloted and implemented in some festival and for nightlife settings in Ukraine, uh, it's really uh, in, in some, have some legislative uncertainty in, in uh, implementing and 
Honestly, we would love to to have in Ukraine the pilot for the for the proper drug checking services as it is available in Netherlands or in Scotland in some other sites. Not Ryogen test, which show, which shows very very limited information. And unfortunately, like we are using Ryogen test, and our partners in Ukraine using them. It's it's a way to start talking about harm reduction with the people who are using drugs. But also uh, with this uh, flexible harm reduction, uh, the uh, overdose prevention and all other uh, necessary interventions, unfortunately, um, the harm reduction services and, and the national funding for harm reduction services uh, are not open for this flexibility yet. Uh, I already summarized this important issues on on the shelters on mental health and gender and, and addressing gender based violence, which uh, really raising in the country because of war. Uh, but I need to say one more uh, issue. I know that we are not political discussion here, but but I need to say that community and state are now trying to hard to formulate the new drug strategy. Uh, and um, civil society actually highlighting the issues of the new drugs, uh, responding uh, on the full-scale invasion in Russia and necessity to, to transform the approaches and to be more effective, uh, not only in harm reduction, opioid substitution treatment, but also in response and decriminalization of the personal use and, uh, and possession and really be more effective in addressing the organized crime. So, so that's just to say that that the Ukrainian community is not keeping silence. Uh, it's very well organized and uh, there, there are national networks of people who use drugs and women who use drugs and, and actually more than 150 organizations in the country providing harm reduction services having daily information from the people who use drugs and ready to support with any means. I guess that that will be uh, it from me. Thank you for this floor and thank you for for opportunity to learn together. Diana, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for that overview, not only of the excellent work you and your colleagues are doing, but uh, flagging up what still needs to be paid attention to and what still needs to be done. A big thank you then to all of our panelists. We have just over half an hour left and we have a couple of questions that have come in. We do welcome more. So please, as we answer this first round, if you have further questions, please do drop them into the Q&A. So I'm going to go, Ruggiero, to you first quickly for the question around drug busts and the spike between 2019 and 2020. And then, Fred, I think you're going to field the other three questions that look at other emerging trends. Ruggiero, go. Yes. Um, so thanks uh, for the for the questions. Uh, it's um, regarding the detection of a given substance or in general, the, the bus of specific laboratories or production sites. It's always important to look at seizures and in general, police operations always uh, with a pinch of salt, so to say. So the increase in seizures uh, and busts in this case doesn't really point at any uh, in increased uh, production. And by extension, uh, the absence of or the decrease uh, of police operations targeting laboratories and synthetic drugs doesn't also imply uh, the absence of the substance in a given market or the presence of uh, drug laboratories. So it is, again, a number which remains a number, which gives an indication. But this said, uh, what probably this increase might, uh, if anything, point at this, uh, is that in 2020, uh, there has been, there's been definitely an increase in the attention that has been given to synthetic drugs and to, to, to laboratories by uh, law enforcement authorities. And in general, so I give much more attention that in, in order to traffic, so also increasing efficiency in terms of policing uh, the and, and also targeting the specific uh, synthetic drug uh, drug markets and also with a specific attention, not only on trafficking, but also on, uh, on production. So this is the way that we feel we should 
um, look at um, when we should feel when when looking at uh, this uh, this kind of numbers. Thank you, Jero. Padir. Uh, yes, I think I can add a little. Uh, it's uh, it's very important to look at statistics uh, in a certain a certain uh, sort of a critical way. Uh, because you know the 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 rapid increase in numbers doesn't mean an increase in in uh, efficiency or the effectiveness uh, of law enforcement. Uh, the problem with the uh, with the law enforcement uh, numbers is that uh, sometimes you know the, the law enforcers uh, have say a month uh, of uh, fighting uh, drugs, then they have a month of fighting uh, you know illegal weapons, so then they have a month of fighting something else, and the numbers are ramped up. Uh, so. It's actually uh, it, it doesn't actually tell you the whole picture. I think I think the seizures uh, would would tell you maybe more, but but you can see that the actually the amount of seizures it's not it hasn't gotten really bigger. It's just small amounts, and as uh, Ghana will probably attest uh, that uh, you know a lot of the people caught and uh, then then jailed for uh, drug related crimes you know actually have like a gram or two grams or three grams of, of drugs on them and that's it and supposedly the number of drugs uh, the drug related crimes and busts by the police has increased dramatically but that doesn't give you the whole picture because for instance what we're seeing is that for instance the uh, the uh, the um, organization the big organization that is monopolizing the ukrainian market which is himprom it is growing uh, but the numbers of, of uh, police bus and other law enforcement agency bus is increasing. Well, we sort of have to look at it critically, I think. But just that's just adding to, to what Ruggiero said. Uh, there are also other questions I can try to answer. Uh, well, the first one is, uh, I guess it's, uh, it's about radioactive narcotics from Ukraine, uh, from the Chernobyl zone. No, we have not heard of uh, radioactive narcotics from Ukraine. The reason there are several reasons for that. First of all, it's uh, called an exclusion zone for a reason because it's actually uh, closed off to the general public. There aren't many people living in the exclusion zone around Chernobyl. There's just several old people who have returned after the Chernobyl uh, accident, and uh, they're not really into drugs. Uh, they're not. They're pretty old people, just pensioners mostly. We, uh, I, I did work as a journalist, as an investigative journalist before, and we did have reports of, for instance, uh, you know, metal uh, coming out from the Chernobyl exclusion zone. So scrap metal basically used and bought from the, and transported from the Chernobyl exclusion zone. But that was a very long time ago. After the invasion, this uh, territory has been basically closed off by the military because it, it was one of the routes that the Russians took to try to capture Kyiv. So there's, uh, it's basically closed off. So no, we have not heard of radioactive um, weed coming from uh, from Ukraine uh, at any point. But th there is weed coming from Ukraine, but it's mostly uh, cultivated in uh, the uh, Bessarabia region, which is the region bordering uh, Romania and Moldova. So it's, the, it's a region to the west of Odessa, to the southwest of Odessa, plus a lot of weed cultivated in the, in the, uh, you know, the big um, drug centers, which would be the large cities. So all the areas around the large cities like Kiev, uh, Dnipro, uh, Lviv, uh, and sort of uh, mountainous western Ukraine, where it's uh, easier to grow uh, grass because it's just covered in forest, forest area. Uh, okay, uh, next question. Has there been a reaction to uh, this report? We have uh, sort of uh, sent this report to the Ukrainian police. We have not had uh, any uh, reaction from them at this point, but we did send it maybe a week ago, maybe 10 days ago. Hopefully after this report uh, is published and gets uh, the attention it deserves from, from the press, then we will have uh, a reaction. But we do talk to uh, representatives of law enforcement, police and other agencies. And uh, some of the things that we included in the report are things we've heard from uh, the security agencies. Um, I think there's another question. I, yeah, what, what sources do you base? Yeah, should no, no. I uh, do that? Yeah, what you can do that. Do you base yeah. What sources do you base your statement about the increase in flow of drugs actively used by the Ukrainian military on? Uh, this is a very good question and thank you for this because uh, you uh, 
should understand, of course you do, that this is unofficial information. This is not information that will be published officially. This is information that comes from our sources, uh, from our trips uh, to the front line, our trips to areas close to the front line, the field work we do. We do receive a lot of information from our sources on specific units, on specific things that happen on the front line. We have received information of organizations that have targeted um, the soldiers. We have received information on places where you can actually buy uh, drugs close to the front line. We have a blog on it, uh, on how these, uh, how they're stored, how they're uh, transported to the front line. We did talk to soldiers, uh, former drug users who have unfortunately gone back to uh, using drugs and they have served and uh, it's sort of, you know, uh, understandable why they would come back to go back to using drugs because of the uh, the stress and the psychological problems that they have. Uh, also, we do talk to a lot of former soldiers because we're doing a, uh, a report on DDR, which is very important because Ukraine has more than a million soldiers now and uh, all of those soldiers will become veterans uh, hopefully in the near future the the sooner the better they will return from the front line and they will bring a lot of problems with them unfortunately and um, as Ghana has already said and uh, we we will sort of mention it in our DDR report that the, the government is working on a policy to tackle that unfortunately uh, and uh, Ghana can add probably um uh, it's not going as fast as it probably should. I think civil society is a lot more active in helping uh, the soldiers at the veterans at this point. And uh, just like Ukraine after 10 years of war still doesn't have a veterans policy, which I think is a disgrace. Uh, and I know a lot of civil society organizations are working on it and knocking on all doors to try to come up with a veterans policy, which will of course include uh, a DDR policy and um, also include a you know harm reduction drug reduction program because it will be a problem and um, you know um, I, I think it's something we need to to talk about. Uh, okay. Thank you, thank you, Fred. That's great. Um, I'm gonna. Do you mind picking up from there because I'm sure that's something you also have views around about what is going to be needed to support the returnees. Uh, who come back from the front line? You hinted at it already in your in your presentation, and you also have the wider regional view of um, combatants who've been drawn in across the region. There are also a number of other questions for you in the chats, looking um, at the why multidisciplinary treatment teams can't be franchised or provided. I assume by the private sector, um, and there was one more. Um. Looking at the the uh, uh, needs to provide services to a widely dispersed dependent population. Actually, uh, what what I wanted to say that yes, Ukraine see this as a problem, not uh, only connected with the drug use, uh, because politically it's um, better to say like we we had this problem before, and and yes, even with the raise of. Um, a uh, number of people who are using drugs, uh, we need to have the system prepared. So, so I already uh, responded and written that, that for, um, central public health uh, do not have the official data, how many people, how, how, how what, what rise of, of the need in substitution treatment will be. But uh, saying, for example, with the uh, a recent pilot in several oblasts with the uh, um, substitution treatment for stimulant users, that's also important initiative from civil society, but together with the Center for Public Health to develop the systems. Unfortunately, with the mental health initiative from the uh, First Lady of, of Ukraine, in an all coordinated initiative, it's not uh, like working so efficient. And and uh, Feder is is right that that civil society organizations, self organization of veterans, uh, they they are. Um, actually trying to get any resources possible, but municipalities, we, are, we have this decentralized state in Ukraine, so, so municipalities and local authorities uh, usually saying, okay, we, we don't have resources. So, so from European point of view, there was question what European uh, union could help 
that's that's about regulating the the legislation. That's about uh, emphasizing in the EU accession process a uh, necessity of developing supporting services. That's also important because the police forces and and our law enforcement system still rather repressive, and they they don't see the the need and uh, necessity of the support for people who who are using drugs. Um, that that's important part of the public health angle for for the any drug policy work. So I would say that from EU, it's also a recommendation on the proper drug policy regulations, which will allow people to receive uh, treatment in 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 the same time to control the trafficking. So so that that's important part to have a balance. I think we all agree that the, a balanced approach is very necessary. It looks like most of our questions are very focused on the trafficking side, though. So, Ruggiero, the origin of cocaine coming into Ukraine would be interesting, please. Um, to you? Yes. So, it's interesting because uh, there's been a, a shift in the trafficking routes as said before during the presentation. So un un until the, the invasion, uh, Odessa port was a major transit hub for, for cocaine. And uh, we have observed um, big quantities of cocaine being seized in the port throughout the, 20, the 2000s, 2010s, uh, originally either directly being shipped from Guayaquil in Ecuador or Santa Marta and Barranquilla in Colombia. So typical um, origin uh, ports, either with stops in West Africa or in Western Europe, and then um, into into the Black Sea, the, the, the destination Odessa. So this was the typical uh, trafficking uh, trafficking trafficking route. Uh, but then what we have seen, and this was actually uh, until the Russian invasion, what we have, what we also seen is that uh, Ukrainian cocaine traffickers were deeply involved in the whole supply chain, uh, with the possibility to have specific deals direct, directly in production sites. What we've seen instead is that since the Russian uh, in naval blockade and the rerouting of, of trafficking uh, flows now entering Ukraine in the West, what we've seen is that at, at least uh, this is data that comes, this is information that comes from the data collection at the wholesale uh, level. To give an idea, uh, now, uh, a kilogram of, of cocaine uh, purchased in, uh, in, uh, in in Ukraine ranges between 40 and 45,000 uh, euro per, per kilogram, which in a way also suggests that uh, probably uh, Ukrainian traffickers really no longer play an important role in the supply chain, but probably act as importers and buying from cocaine traffickers, which instead use Western European ports, uh, in particular, of course, Rotterdam and Antwerp, but also Southeastern European ports, and particularly the port of, uh, ports of uh, Greece and uh, Albania, but in general, the Adriatic coast as well. Um, yes, it, this uh, includes also uh, other uh, neighboring countries, so yes, uh, we have collected in the report a number of police operations that really point also at the involvement, of course, of neighboring countries of Ukraine in the West. Uh, definitely uh, the Czech Republic, but also Hungary and Slovakia, uh, and uh, above all, probably uh, Romania, as far as cocaine is uh, is concerned. Uh, with other directions uh, included, we can't really, uh, we didn't really conduct any any study in in Belarus, uh, although uh, it's believed to be uh, a key uh, transit country, especially because <clears throat> at least as far as cocaine is concerned, we have also um, progressively detected uh, shipments of cocaine going from Latin America then directly to, for example, the port of St. Petersburg. Uh, and it is um, plausible that uh, some of the cocaine that enters uh, Russia in the in the north in the northwest might also end up in uh, in, uh, in of course in Belarus and then direction south or towards the south direction uh, Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian markets and neighboring countries as well. Thank you. There's one more question about routes and linkages, which came from Kate Trance. 
looking at whether or not you see a link between North African actors and those in the Ukraine, both state and organized crime related to the drug trade. I can I can try to answer. Um, <laughs> well, uh, Ukraine sorry. is not. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, sorry. Um, Ukraine is is not high up in the anti-corruption uh, sort of uh, list of countries. So uh, corruption is a problem here in Ukraine. And uh, of course, we do have sort of a lot of information we cannot tell you at this point. But we are seeing, that, for instance, the uh, the uh, rapid uh, rise of, uh, of Kimprom and other groups uh, is just impossible without them having some sort of collaborate, uh, collaboration with uh, with at least law enforcement um, in certain areas and probably law enforcement uh, in, in Kiev, so to speak. We are seeing some links uh, between organized crime and uh, the, the dimensioned drug group uh, and um, authorities uh, in the regions. We are seeing that a, uh, for instance, a change in the head of the police of a region actually changes the situation with uh, drugs in a certain region. It is, uh, for some reason, it is on the rise after there is a new police chief or for instance, uh, an old police chief, uh, some police chief moves to another region and uh, sort of production uh, for some reason moves together with him. So there is a, a link, a direct link, so to speak, and we can say that yes, and that will de that definitely um, actually affects the whole situation, of course. Um, the, there was also uh, some, some um, a question on, on uh, routes, um, and I can try to answer like several questions in one uh, batch. Uh, there was also a question on uh, Ukrainian military using new technologies in the war. And uh, are uh, Ukrainian law, law enforcement agents using new technology? Uh, I would uh, sort of answer it in a different way. We are seeing that uh, organized crime is actually using uh, new technologies in, in different new ways. Uh, I think it was 10 days ago that a drone uh, was shot, uh, shot down over in the Volin region, which is I think Krzysztof was uh, for, probably from Poland. So uh, in the Volin region, which is close to Poland, and it was carrying nearly 20 kilos of uh, hash, uh, hashish. So uh, for the, uh, when we talk about routes, the important thing to understand in Ukraine is that uh, what matters is the profit margin. So uh, right now, the uh, the biggest profit margin is uh, humans, uh, human smuggling, not human trafficking, not drug trafficking from Ukraine, not weapons, God forbid, trafficking, but uh, military age men who for one reason or another want to leave Ukraine. So that is, the routes are the same that the smugglers used, but the commodity changes. Right now, the biggest commodity is people, military age men. So I know for a fact that a lot of the cigarette smugglers uh, have dropped uh, sort of uh, smuggling and moving cigarettes and have now switched to uh, military age men. So, uh, so if we take routes, the routes are already there. They're all there. It's just that the commodity changes. So the the danger is that uh, after it is the, the after the criminals will not have a high profit margin when they smuggle people out of Ukraine, military age men in particular, they will switch to other things. And one of those things will probably be drugs. Because of course, as you understand, when you take drug smuggling and weapon smuggling, it's easier to smuggle a kilo of cocaine than a truckload or a boatload of you know, weapons. So it's, it's all profit. It all has to do with profit. Thank you. Thank you, Fadir. I mean, you half answered the question on human trafficking and links. So I think that was very helpful. Um, I'm just running through to see if there are any other questions that we missed. Um, Hakan, nice to see an old friend, but uh, I think that there was a, an overall sense throughout the presentations that we would expect rises in, I mean, well, a degradation in the quality of the ability to enforce and the rule of law and a, probably a concomitant rise in illicit economies post-conflict simply because of the the challenges of rebuilding a post-conflict society. That said, I would say across the work that we've done in the observatory, one thing that is very noticeable is actually how consistent Ukraine's focus has been both on responding to 
law enforcement challenges, trying to close down spaces for organized crime and to increasingly tackle corruption. And while I think there's mixed signals on how effective some of those efforts have been, for a country at war, they do show a degree of commitment that you know we certainly wouldn't see as typical or we're in a position, I would say, particularly to criticize. In the last couple of rounds, since the questions have almost stopped, I'd like to give the floor back to all of our panelists. There are a few questions that hint at what can we do? How can Europeans support law enforcement, support the drug um, depend policy and drug dependence treatment and care networks? I would love it if you would all take the last opportunity to close your remarks from this panel with an, your sense of what the priorities are to see Western European support to Ukraine to respond to the problems of drug trafficking and use. Ghana, since you are our guest today, can I give you the floor first? Yes, uh, I hope that that with this professional network and with this uh, outcomes of the report, we will uh, try to help uh, with all, all over the European countries and Eastern Europe to develop the real, real comprehensive uh, harm reduction services responding not only to HIV epidemic, not only to HCV or, or tuberculosis problem, but, but also to have this uh, second leg, uh, like fighting the trafficking, but also supporting people. And uh, actually we are all watching the same news and we are, uh, we are all uh, caring about uh, our relatives uh, in Ukraine or our friends who are, uh, who are fleeing from Ukraine. And in this case, uh, we, all, uh, we are all very interested in developing the harm reduction and mental health care for people who need this. So, so hopefully, with the uh, with, with the cooperation between these two legs, two uh, two arms, we could develop the balance strategy and balance approaches. Thank you. Thank you, Ghana. Ruggiero. Uh, very quickly, two points from my side. Uh, first of all, uh, my main takeaway here is to uh, the, the the relevance and the importance of monitoring. Uh, PTSD and also how uh, the newly uh, introduced law on medical uh, cannabis use will impact um, the uh, the discourse on the on the one side, but also at the operational level, uh, how, how uh, PTSD is going to be treated in Ukraine. And in terms of what, uh, in general, the West uh, and also it can do, uh, learning from experiences of uh, countries uh, that have already introduced this law is something that can be done not only in countries which have similar uh, social dynamics of, of Ukraine, and I'm talking about the wider uh, Eastern uh, European, or Southeastern European region, there are examples, um, but also overseas, especially uh, the experience of Canada. And also on the other side, still on the what the, 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 the West can do, and I really believe that there is a lot of uh, space for especially uh, European Union agencies, and I'm here referring to particularly the EMCDDA, uh, in providing the tools, it's something that is already, by the way, uh, is doing, but it definitely reinforces the support, uh, especially in, ta in tackling the rise in MPS. The MCDA possesses the resources and the tools to tackle it. Thank you, Ruggiero. And Fred, the last word in our presentation to you. Uh, well, just maybe two points. Uh, one point that I think uh, because of the war in Ukraine, uh, it has a unique situation. And I think, first of all, uh, we are seeing that if you take the drug market, that uh, organized crime is adapting very quickly. It has adapted very quickly. It has changed to meet the, the, the new challenges. And I think that it's important that the Ukrainian law enforcement, together with the partners from, from European agencies and other agencies, adapt to this new reality also, and very quickly, because uh, as we're seeing, the new reality is spreading from Ukraine to neighboring countries and will spread more. Uh, the second, I think that uh, that uh, Ukraine, uh, in terms of DDR and drug use, can become a testing ground because of the unique number of people and uh, uh, that will return from the front line. And I think it, uh, that this policy 
could be developed very quickly with the help of civil society and could be used by other countries in the future. I think it's it's just the chance that that civil society and the government need to use, but to use very quickly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Wise words from all of our panelists. So as we close now, I'd like to say a very, very big thank you to everybody who joined us here for this presentation today. We encourage you, of course, to go to our website at www.globalinitiative.net if you want to download the report or any of the other reports that relate to this topic or to check out our wider research on uh, drug trafficking and drug markets. We And to watch the space for some of our upcoming reports on similar themes. As I said, we do have an upcoming report on DDR that looks at challenges of responding to vulnerabilities from the illicit economy in the process of DDR, as well as our upcoming report on arms trafficking flows and the report on Russian drug markets. And I will close today by offering, again, one more round of the greatest of thanks to Ghana for joining us and uh, for all the work that you do with the EHRA and to Roger and Fadir for the fantastic work and representation of the GI. Thank you very much for sharing the presentation. And um, if there are any follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to e email us. Great pleasure to see everybody and have a fantastic afternoon. <laughs>